Politicians are kicking yesterday and today. So, um, as you may remember, around our retreat on Friday, we had an in-depth discussion about the various ways we could generate money necessary to run the district. This would include money for employee raises, as well as operating priorities, such as textbooks, care centers, SEL, and other upgrades. We have been discussing this for months, but this is the last time we had a clearer view of the available resources. At present, we have enough revenue to offer a paltry 3% raise to all employees, far short of the amount that we approved in this budget that was sent to the mayor. There's very, there's very little left over for anything else, and Dr. Battle has presented us a plan that will, the, the little bit that we have left over will go to benefit students directly. You all may also remember that during the council's deliberation on the various budget proposals, the point was often made that the mayor's budget was not sufficient. Then the school board could ask Metro taxpayers directly for the money by way of referendum on the August 1st ballot. This language was found in section 9.04 of the Metro Charter and clearly they lays out the mechanism for adding the referendum to this ballot. The Metro Charter guides the work of our city in as a great and well-intentioned document, but it's far from perfect. It was crafted long before early voting was considered. Section 9.04 of the Charter is in direct conflict with the Section 23024 of the Tennessee Statute. The election timeline in that law would not permit the board to add this referendum to the ballot. In other words, the school board does not have any way to invoke the Metro Charter provision that allows the opportunity to pick out additional revenue to meet the needs of the district. Even if we vote 9-0 on the referendum, and it needs a nine, it needs a two-thirds vote, I might add. And, um, you know, this is Anna talking. I'm not sure I want to do the job of the Metro Council. Our job is to outlay our expense, uh, our budget, and our job is to prevent, to present that to the council and to the mayor and say, this is what we need, this is your job, you need to fund us. Just personal point of, um, uh, on that. I believe the mayor, Metro Council, and the school board all thought that the charter school 9.04 was an opportunity that was available to the board, it is not. Having an opportunity that you cannot use is the same thing as not having that opportunity at all. It's, a, it's disappointing that the council was willing to abdicate their responsibility by handing it off to the school board to make the choice regarding a referendum. There will be no chance of the referendum because passing the ballot language will never see the light of day. It brings us to, the, to today. We have a budget before us a budget that we all agree is not nearly enough to sufficiently meet the needs of the city of, of the children of Nashville or come close to paying the, the district's employees that they deserve. No amount of thermostat adjusting or paperclip hoarding will find us the $8 million necessary to give our employees the step raise they do. This step raise is vital. It is so vital that Mayor Briley sought to include it in every Metro's employee salary next year, except for those working for MMPS. That's immoral, in my personal opinion. We have a job to do. We are required to pass a budget. And traditionally, we have done this by July 1st of each year. This means that tonight's the night. I'm advocating that we pass the budget before us and, that, and continue to advocate to the mayor to add the additional $8 million necessary to bring us in line with other Metro employees. I'll be happy to meet with anybody who wants to go to the mayor and state our, our cause. MMPS employees on par with, with, with any employee in the city. I am upset that the mayor's budget did not include a step increase for our employees because that means to me that our employees are not as important as Metro employees, and I vehemently disagree with that. So I'll hand it off. Hello? Yeah, we're, we're here. Um, okay. 
Were you wanting to hand that off to uh, someone in particular or just those around the table? Yeah, those around the table. And you, Chris. Um, okay, I'll, I will uh, kick off and just uh, maybe repeat a little bit of what I said at the retreat on Friday. Um, you have a copy of the uh, summary page of the budget that's being recommended right. by Dr. Battle and the administration. And you have that in front of you, which, uh, as you know, has a 3% raise in it for all employees, but does not have a step increase. We also have the $2.7 million increase to the property tax refund MDHA tax increment cost. Uh, so we actually, instead of 28.2 million, we have about 25.5 million in additional funds. We were able to identify uh, approximately 2.2 million in uh, savings or reductions. Uh, you can see that at the bottom part of the page. Uh, we are able to, uh, and that it consists of 11 non-school-based positions. Uh, it consists of reductions uh, in contracted services of a little over 600,000, and then other various additions and reductions throughout the budget of another 600,000. Uh, we are able to, uh, in this proposal, to continue with the Oracle R12 conversion that, that would basically is being uh, required of us for Metro government. Uh, we are able to continue with our existing pre-K program, uh, specifically those 22 pre-K classrooms that have been funded uh, for the last several years from the federal pre-K expansion grant, as well as the additional staff at the Cambridge Early Learning Center that have been funded from the federal grant. Uh, that grant will sunset at mid-year. And then uh, we have our charter school increase for the increase in students that will be enrolled in charter school as, as well as the change to the per pupil amount uh, that is state and local revenue per pupil set in state statute. Um, with that 2.2 million in savings at the bottom of the page, we have included an additional 1.7 million for textbooks, which would be added to the 2.1 million that's already budget, budgeted for textbooks giving a total of 3.8 million. Dr. David Williams uh, has laid out how that 3.8 million uh, in additional uh, monies for textbooks would be spent mainly in the areas of social studies, world languages, science, and arts and music. Uh, there are also some other smaller areas um, where the, the textbook uh, account would be impacted. And then uh, we went back to the original proposal uh, back on from March 5th in the first draft regarding social and emotional learning, adding 5.5 positions at a, uh, an additional cost, non-personnel costs uh, as well, that would total about 460,000. Um, Dr. Majors discussed what that would look like at the retreat on Friday. Uh, so this is the proposal from Dr. Battle and the administration regarding the funding amount that was approved by the Metro Council on June 18th. Happy to answer any questions that anyone may have regarding that proposal or any, anything else. Uh, I'm not doing it. Jill? Uh, Chris, it, I, I think I understood you to say that textbooks was $3.8 million. Yeah, we currently have uh, 2.1 million budgeted for textbooks, and so this would add an additional 1.7 million. And uh, Dr. David Williams had put together a textbook proposal on how to spend uh, and what that number would need to look like to be able to do this, which is basically minimal compared to what was originally requested and what's actually needed. But we were trying to get to his $3.8 million number uh, so that we could at least do this as far as textbooks goes. Uh, since textbooks, of course, was one of uh, the one of the top uh, board and district budget priorities. Right. Uh, so that that 1.7 would actually equate to a total budget of 3.8 million. Thank you. So can you um, enumerate for me what are the 11 non-school-based positions that we reduced that we got rid of? <clears throat> The 11 non-school-based uh, positions are included in document number two of the budget that the board approved back on April 9th, and I'll just go through those. Um, we had a reorganization in student assignment where we reduced a coordinator position. Uh, we re are reducing here uh, two EDSSIs, executive directors for school support and improvement. 
uh, reducing an executive director in student services uh, due to retirement, uh, reducing an executive director for equity and diversity, uh, reducing an inventory position, as well as five maintenance staff to get to the 11 million, uh, the 11 positions at just over a million dollars. And that would include both salary and benefits. So that's total position costs. Okay, thanks. So uh, I want to go back to something that was discussed at the retreat and has been discussed in previous board meetings. Um, you know, hypothetically, if a, uh, if a group of magnet schools came to us or a group of pre-K centers or a group of other specialty schools came to us and said, hey, um, we need uh, money to add seats and that's going to come at the expense of employee salaries across the school system, we would say no go. Uh, but for some reason, we decide year after year after year to roll over uh, for these charter schools. And, um, and it's, you know, 9 million this year, it was 13, 12 or 13 million in the current fiscal year that's ending. And it's, you know, 10 million previous years. And the, the absurdity of all of it is we haven't approved a new charter school for years and we're still having to feed uh, all of this new money uh, and let them be first at the trough. And uh, regardless of how you feel about tr charter schools, somebody called me today and had a, you know, challenged me intellectually, and um, and as you guys know, that normally doesn't go very well for me. But I listened, and and it it connected. And the person said, "Look, you know, charters are 15 percent of the school system in terms of enrollment, but this contemplated budget gives them 35 percent of all available new revenue after you factor out the uh, the uh, tax increment uh, payment that we have to pay backward." to MDHA, and, um, and why is 15% of the school system getting 35% of all available new revenue at the expense of employee compensation? And I said, you know, it's a good, it's a good number. And uh, I said, I'm against the charter outlay on its face, but now that I hear it put that way, I've, I've never thought of it that way. So I think, um, you know, it's time to really come to grips with uh, the effect that negative uh, the, the negative fiscal impact that unabated charter growth has had on this school system and do something about it. And I think it's a moral obligation. I think we should have done something ar about it arguably a year ago or more uh, in the current fiscal year. We're taking in $5 million in new revenue, 12 or $13 million of it's going right out the door to, to fund charter growth, which is not needed and some would argue not wanted uh, in the school system. The waiting list, the demand is not with charter schools, it's with our uh, magnet schools and pre-K centers and, and others. So I think it's overdue time to take a moral stand here and say we're not going to continue to fund uh, unneeded charter growth at the expense of employees. And with that, I would like to, I've got some other things I want to say, but I guess that's a preamble to a motion. I'd like to make a motion that we zero out uh, the $8.9 million for charter school uh, growth money that's on this uh, current budget proposal and instead redirect that to uh, certificated and support step increases uh, and other uh, things. It would, you know, the step increases would be $8 million total, which would leave a little over 900000 to work with. We could leave that with the charter schools or we could send it to somewhere like trauma care centers or uh, SEL, but um, but as a starting point, I want to take at least eight million dollars from that line and move it to uh, certificated and support um, salary step increases. And I would appreciate a second for the purposes of discussion. Second. Thank you. So, um, until anybody else has something else to say, I will say uh, there's a myth going around that we have to provide this money to charter schools, and that's actually just what I said it is. It's a myth. There is a um, statute that was revised in uh, 2017. Nobody really noticed it at the time, and of course that's what happens when you have a third, 132 legislators all adding you know, their own little pieces of language to it. But Tennessee Code Annotated 4913-112 um, has in it uh, language that says an LEA, a local education agency, that's us, shall not may, but shall adjust payments to the charter schools um, based on, among other factors, changes in revenue. And there is nobody who has watched what's happened in the MNPS budget over the last few years that would argue that we have not had a substantial change in revenue. Uh, for 
a number of years, we would ordinarily get 35, 40 million, 40 million plus in additional new revenue to work with, and that kind of masked the problem. And one of the reasons we were getting that much year over year is because uh, previous mayors were drawing down on the fund balance, or surplus, in order to match uh, one-time monies to recurring expenditures. Well, this was the first year where we were not able to uh, draw down the fund balance because there was not enough money left to match one-time money to recurring expenditures. Therefore, um, we got the situation that we have this year where we got $5 million in new revenue to work with, 13, 12, 13 million going out the door to charters, which was completely unfair um, to employees, and that's why there were no uh, significant adjustments in employee compensation this year in the current fiscal year, which is almost over like there should have been. Uh, it's going to take us a number of years to recover from the structural uh, imbalances that have been built up over time. Um, but, uh, but I think a good uh, starting point is to look at the literal um, statute and say, you know, we not just may adjust, we shall adjust payments to charter schools based on changes in revenue. We've had changes in revenue, and I think that the, uh, the decision point here is, you know, are we going to continue to fund um, unabated charter growth, or are we going to fund employee compensation increases as we should? And the other thing I would just point out is what we're talking about here is not cutting uh, charter schools like a lot of other parts of the school system have been cut. This, this is uh, just saying, you know, look, we just don't have enough money to give you to continue to grow. Uh, so this is not going to hurt them one bit. This is just uh, going to help teachers. So uh, I uh, renew my motion. and would entertain any additional conversation about this. Have we gotten any opinions from Metro Legal about this? Um, I've, I've spoken with Ms. Harkey a couple of different times, and I, th and I, I don't want to speak for her, but I think she uh, uh, agrees that a literal interpretation, um, you know, is, is Kind of that yellow language that I've that I've highlighted in the statute. I think she's also concerned, at the same time, about political um, kind of repercussions. And, and and you know there obviously could be. I mean, when this board in 2012 voted against Great Hearts, um, the uh, the uh, charter school that was going to uh, cut off transportation into West Nashville in order to have a gerrymandered student population, this board. Um, voted against Great Arts, and the state reacted with a $3.4 million fine uh, in which they withheld BEP funds by uh, and redistributed those to charter schools. Um, I will say on that vote, um, I was on the wrong side of that vote, um, and something Ms. Spearing and I have talked about over the years, I, I've, I regret my vote. I thought at the time we could work with the state, but I think I learned the hard way that there is no working with them, and when you look at Kind of the the the, the Glen Cassida um, uh, cabal that has created this environment. I think uh, you know at some point you know we have to say okay, let's do what's right first and foremost. And if there has to be uh, a political and a and a legal conversation afterward, then let's have that. But uh, but I've talked to other lawyers and lobbyists who are close to this process, and they basically have described this language is kind of a jump ball. You know, it could go either way. Um, it, it's a, I mean, everybody knows the great secret um, in Nashville and in Tennessee is the charter law is one of the most poorly constructed laws uh, on the books, not just in this state or in America. And it's because there's so many different special interests uh, at play. But somehow, somebody put this language um, in there two years ago uh, that allows us to, quote unquote, adjust payments uh, to the charter schools uh, based on changes in revenue. and. A literal reading says, you know, this is what we can do. Now, what happens next? You know, who knows? So I have some questions. Uh, maybe Mr. Queen can answer. So how many students does that eight point, how much is it? 856 students. 856 students that are currently in not currently enrolled, projected to be enrolled. Well, if based on I were a parent, I would have known by today that they were enrolled in that school and ready to send my child to that school in August, right? Well, I, all I can tell you is every year they fail to meet their enrollment projections, um, and the enrollment is not something at charter schools that's handled by the end of June or the end of July. It happens over the course on a rolling basis over the course of the year. So. It's very rare that charter schools actually consume all of the new revenue that's set aside for them. 
that being said, these are families who, many of them, who already understand where their child's going to go and have been working towards that goal since they were notified whenever that was in the spring. So they would have to adjust and fig go back to, or figure out another placement for their child if we did this. They'd have to figure that out before the first day of school. Maybe. I think another way to look at it is uh, Ms. Bush has widely, wisely brought forward a motion to close the Knowledge Academies, uh, which currently have a projected 792 enrolled, which would equate to 8.2 million. Um, so uh, these are all, you know, these are moving targets. These aren't static numbers. And uh, should we uh, close those schools, then we'll be able to claw back that amount of money. Now that's, you know, a couple of more weeks from now, but uh, and we can debate that at that time. But, um, but no, it's not as simple as saying there is X number of families who are expecting Y number of services um, because uh, the, you know, the sector is just so unsettled and, un and, and, and wide open. I'm just not going to buy the assumption that these, the majority of these seats are to be determined kids. I would imagine a lot of them, families have made decisions that there are siblings that are joining siblings and that sort of thing. Um, I think it's a completely fair decision to say that you want to fund charter growth at the expense of employee compensation. I mean, I, I think that's that's a fair position, and I'm not going to argue with it. If we say that we are removing the charter growth money that only affects those 856 projected seats, does it affect any other current students within those schools? Is it just the future classrooms within those schools? I, I will add that that 8.9 million, if you look at the description, that uh, is based upon the increase in student enrollment, but it's also the increase in the per pupil rate for existing okay. students, because of course, as the budget increases, typically the per pupil rate will increase for all students that attend the charter. And it's the same, you know, per pupil rate as the district. It's total state and local revenue per student. So a, a part of that number is the projected increase in the per pupil rate, but the majority is uh, the increase in projected enrollment in charters. So my understanding was that that, that 8.9 million was a multiplier of 10,400 per pupil. Is, is there a different number we need to be looking at, Mr. Henson? Now that 10,400 number is an increase uh, from the current year, and mm -hmm. so that's a part of this this 8.9. That what, where were we in the current year? Um, we were somewhere around 10. Can't remember the exact number. What it ended up being. Uh, so that 10,400 10, is an increase over what we currently have based upon projected state and local revenue. Okay. But again, the majority is projected increase in student enrollment. So the, the delta between 10,000 and 10, four, uh, for 856 students is $342,307. So that's kind of nominal relative to the total line item there. So it may change the conversation a little bit. I just left the um, hearing for us for KA and the judge is not going to rule until tomorrow. Um, but we're still in the uphill battle a little bit because she, um, there may be some depositions. There is a process that I think she may put in place. Um, so we just have to wait on that decision tomorrow. So I don't know. This is definitely, we could change the conversation about the number of students. Uh, because right now, KA is still moving forward on uh, enrollment. Um, I actually got a door hanger this weekend on recruiting kids um, on my door. So they're still moving forward. and. According to the judge, she was a little concerned about uh, the time frame of giving students and families the time to uh, find um, other schools to attend. So uh, we kind of at a medium. I don't. We just kind of don't know where she's going to be at, and but she'll she'll rule tomorrow. So just to give you guys an update. The irony of it, of course, is we haven't taken any action on knowledge academies yet so it's hard to enjoin something that hasn't happened now you know if, if a vote's taken and then they go back then that's obviously a different thing but that's a good update thank you for that the um i wonder how do you uh, just out of curiosity I mean, we can talk offline but how do you think they knew how to reach you at the door do you think i mean 
Did you sign up, I mean, to get information oh, or no. wonder where they got your information mm -hmm. from? No, I just think well, they were canvassing the neighborhoods. Um, I think they have uh, representatives from the school that are going to different uh, neighborhoods. I'm assuming that the enrollment is low. So they had an open house last week, and according to the attorneys, they had 26 new families to sign up, um, basically to convince the judge that they are in a good spot. Um, she, uh, they also said that they were in the top of the top percentage percentile as far as academic success. Um, so that was, of course, not true. Um, so it's, I think their enrollment is down. I think they're getting a little bit um, um, nervous about the numbers, but I don't know the numbers. So that's yeah, that's what they're doing right now. Yeah, that's exactly what's happening. I asked for the numbers. Um, yesterday and their projected going into the upcoming year was 951 at all three schools current enrollment is 792 which is a, uh, a uh, uh, dip of about 17 percent so they're they're panicking just on their enrollment much less the idea that we would close them down for uh, financial malfeasance which we have the right to do under statute so it's um and to miss miss poopa walker's point you know these projections are all uh, it, 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 most of them uh, are based on, you know, they're built on sand, uh, you know, knowledge academies. That number, um, 8.9 million, includes, um, uh, you know, over 150 students for knowledge academies who clearly aren't there right now. Now, they may be an outlier or they may not be, but it's hard to say because there's not, little, not a lot of transparency there. I guess for the, oh, sorry, Amy. Uh, I guess for discussion, I I have said that I feel like our teachers deserve and need a step increase that is necessary for their, I mean, it's breaking our word in my opinion, but it's also um, hurting their long-term earning potential, whether that's their current earning potential or their retirement earning potential, and I find that disgraceful, and it's something that we need to be serious about. So I have been encouraged that as a board, like my colleague, Mrs. Sparing, uh, brought up on Friday of we need to try to find the $8 million, but we are not able to find it with the funding that we have. It's, it does not exist, and this is the only solution that has been brought to find that $8 million. Um, and so I am glad that we're entertaining it. I am concerned about the potential repercussions. I know that there's no crystal ball to predict what those repercussions are. Um, and I guess that's, for right now, I guess that's my discussion, but I'm gonna pass to Amy. Volley over. So, um, so the problem here is that we are funding parallel school systems and one system under state law gets funded no matter what and the other system has to make cuts when necessary. So that's just kind of a patently unfair process and that's where we're stuck but that's the structure of state law um, and so it puts us in a very difficult position where we face these unfair choices because I think everybody would prefer to make sure that our teachers are paid or get their step raises this year um, but um, the charter laws in Tennessee are untested that the, the laws are so new that really there haven't been lawsuits um, this, I think France may be the first with the um, knowledge academies and um, so I did have a conversation with Corey Harkey about this. Um, she felt that um, any court would read the language to say that we are required to fund charter schools. Um, and again, that's untested and legal opinions differ. Uh, but uh, the concern is that I think most certainly there would be a lawsuit generated on this and, and I'm not afraid of lawsuits and I, I voted against great heart, so I was, not, I was not afraid of the political ramifications of that, although I didn't predict what would happen on that case. Um, so I, I'm not afraid of doing a politically difficult thing to do, but I think with the language that's in the statute, and, and I think the, the, the fact that we have no idea what the state's gonna do, particularly under the current leadership, um, I think the possibility of a state takeover of our schools is, um, is a, you know, that's a, a daunting, uh, proposition for us and so I just think that I would prefer um, to focus on closing down charter schools that are having major problems like New Vision 
Um, I don't think we focused enough on the, the charter schools where there are, are funding issues or our financial uh, financial challenges and uh, um, you know that we have we have schools that are violating fire codes that kind of thing I think that would be a better use of our energy than just um, trying to buck this new law um, which is just gonna I think lead to a lot of negative consequences so um, but I, I would you know I do I th think it's important to have a larger conversation about what, what we really want to fund and and, uh, and and to advocate at the state level for changes, uh, which I've been doing for many years now because it is a fundamentally unfair law. I think if, if we have cuts, that should apply to all kinds of schools, not just the traditional schools. So. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, like I said earlier, the one, you know, the, the one of the votes I regret most is the very first vote I took on this board in 2012, and you cast your vote in the right direction. I cast my vote in the wrong direction because I was trying to, um, you know, thread the needle on politics. And there is just no dealing with these state people. And I've come to the conclusion over the years that, you know, best to do what's right. You know, when you've got a recalcitrant executive branch, uh, which we've got, you've got a recalcitrant legislative branch, which is putting all these new. Uh, uh, hostile state laws on top of us. Sometimes the only place to go is the third branch of government, which is the court system. So, you know, if we do this and if they choose to pursue us in court or if they choose to um, uh, do what they did to us in Great Hearts, which is fine us, and then we try to pursue them in court to recover that, then, you know, I'm at peace with that. Um, the um, I will say that anybody who's you know, plugged into the conversation in the city right now uh, has probably heard that the state has been circling for months around a partial or full state takeover, including but not limited to the Whites Creek cluster. So I think we're already there and we'll have to, to fight that uh, decision um, uh, when that comes after the mayor's race is over. But for now, I think it's really just kind of a straight up and down moral argument. Are we going to fund charter growth regardless of, um, of, uh, of what it does to to employees or are we going to do what's right and it's I'm just I've boiled it down to a straight up and down moral decision at this point all right hi again do you mind coming up and maybe giving us like an overview I kind of tell the board what happened a little bit just kind of bring them up to speed are you able to speak on maybe an overview about the yeah yes yes, yes. Okay. Um, the Basically, the judge has, at this point, is planning to issue her order tomorrow. Um, there was some lively discussion as part of the hearing. Um, I, I think other than waiting to see what the judge does tomorrow, I think that we, we just need to kind of sit tight and, and see what she does. Um, she definitely was concerned about making sure that this board could move forward with its duties as the Board of Education in terms of reviewing charters. Um, but, but I think what we should... It was almost a, an hour and a half, two hour length hearing, and um, and she she understands the timeline and is, is going to try to get an an order out tomorrow. Yeah. And when she spoke about charters, she was really it, she had that book open. So to kind of go back to the the law of charter, she was very focused, and it was very interesting to see how. We were talking about the court of law and talking about how they follow the law, and she was really in that book. I mean, she was. Chancellor Martin is somebody who definitely does her homework, so she was certainly familiar with the law and certainly familiar with the cases that were being argued, um, and she had a lot of questions uh, from from both sides. Um, and you know, I again, I think she did at least she recognized the board of ed's need to be able to to fill it fulfill its duties, and so we'll wait and see what comes tomorrow. Do you think that she was interpreting what was actually in the statute versus what the legislator legislature intended to be in the statute? In turn, which which specific which language specifically are you talking about? I don't know. I wasn't there. <laughs> um, I mean, so this was a hearing. This was about um, really whether or not there had been an open meetings violation in the discussion related to knowledge academies, and so much of the discussion was. Uh, without necessarily knowing, other than the de declarations from uh, Sharon Gentry and Fran Bush and Dennis Queen, the, the, the question was really what, what occurred in that meeting and was it a violation of the Open Meetings Act? Um, obviously, from Metro's position is nothing has occurred related to Knowledge Academy. No, 
no motion, no decision, nothing has happened. Um, and so she is, is taking under advisement as to whether or not additional information needs to come out about what occurred in, in the executive session, um, but also recognizing you know, that the board has an obligation to oversee charters and to potentially review and make revocation decisions. So um, that's kind of where she left it. And she, she, again, she said she would get us an order tomorrow. And then just kind of going back to other conversations we've had in the past about other lawsuits, um, you know, the one thing that I remember you and Ms. Fox drilling into me relentlessly is judges don't interpret what they think the legislature intended. They interpret what's actually in the code. Um, so I assume that whatever her interpretation was, and I know she's not the one ever seeing the yeah. data lawsuit, but, but, but is it still your position that judges interpret what's in black and white, not what they think somebody the thought was going to happen? Statutory interpretation is supposed to be based on the, the clear language in the statute, reading the statute as a whole. Um, and to, to move towards statutory interpretation, you're supposed to see some kind of ambiguity within the, the language, the, pure, the plain language of the statute that would send you to discuss the statutory interpretation. The, the Knowledge Academy case that we were just in, there, there wasn't a whole lot of discussion related to that topic, but you, you are correct in that um, statutory construction is based on the plain meaning of the law. I'd like to call for the question if there's no other comments. I know we're, we're We've been kind of rudderless, Ms. Bugs. Ms. Shepard's on the phone, um, but. Uh, Did you have anything you wanted to say, Ms. Shepard? Yeah, you know, I know that Will loves to get up every morning and fight the fight. Ah, I'm really not really willing to get up and fight the fight for the charter school referendum. Um, just because I know that we will be sued by every charter school in Nashville and the state DOE. And, I, and saying that, we need to find $8 million for our step increase. So we need to pressure the mayor and the council to make that happen. Yeah, I, I agree with Ms. Shepard. I mean, I don't like fighting. Sometimes I do, but not all the time. But um, <laughs> but again, we're getting ready to give 15% of the school system 35% of the new available revenue if right. we go this path. Right. So let's just be eyes wide open and be prepared to explain to employees that we were uh, feeding the privatization sector at the expense of um, employee pay raises. That's that's the bottom line here. And so I would like to call the question unless there's any other discussion or comments. All right, can I hear the motion in a second again? Yeah, the motion is to um, uh, take $8 million out of the line item to fund charter school growth and instead redirect that to employee compensation, specifically a certificated salary step increase as well as a support salary step increase. All right, is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye, or I'm sorry, all in favor raise your hand. I can't vote. You have two? All right, all opposed? We have five. And Ms. Gentry and Ms. Shepard are not, cannot vote. All right. I have another uh, proposal. Two years ago in 2017-18, due to a decrease in projected student enrollment, MNPS experienced a shortfall in revenue of seven seven point five million dollars when board members vo voiced concern about the shortfall, the administration framed it as less than 1% of the budget. That's in quotes. Uh, I would venture to say that no one on this board disagrees that teachers are underpaid. Just last week at the board retreat, all of you presented information on the average salary compensation for metro schools and comparable school districts for this year, 2019 to 20. Uh, it revealed our principals and many assistant principals as well as our teachers are understaffed and underpaid. Uh, Interestingly, comparison data for central office salaries were omitted in this um, 
chart, the compensation comparison suggested that on average, Metro teachers make $3,500 less than comparable districts. Today, we find ourselves in a precarious position. Last year, personnel did not receive the 3% promised pay raise, uh, yet the mayor has merely offered a 3% COLA. The council was not able to help or didn't ra help um, raise teacher pay last week during the efforts to offer an alternative budget. Now it's up to each one of the board members here to do the right thing for our teachers and, and students. Research is clear that the number one factor contributing to student achievement is the teacher in the classroom. In terms of student success, the teacher's influence surpasses the influence of home, including parent participation at school, conditions relating to socioeconomics, structure of schools, including class sizes and curricula, and yes, even the impact of the principal pales in relationship to the importance of this one factor, the teacher in the classroom. When I was a teacher in Metro schools for 25 years, step raises were consistent. This consistent apparently continued through 2012, 2013. But then teachers went four years without a step raise. In 2014, 15, 13.2% of our teachers left Metro schools. In 2015, 16, 14.3% of our teachers left Metro schools. In 2016, 12.9% of, of our teachers left. And in 2017, 18, 14.8% of our teachers left Metro schools. Unfortunately, no data is yet available for 2018, 19. The last step raise teachers received was in 2017, 18. Low wages and low morale also affect our ability to hire enough teachers to man classrooms. In April of 2019, there were 322 open positions. In May, on May 3rd, 488 positions were unfilled. On May 10th, 537 positions were posted. On the last day of school, 541 teaching positions were posted, and that number included transfers as well. During Dr. Battle's listen-in sessions, I heard how difficult it was to find math and science teachers. Therefore, we had to resort to ingenuity, which substituted a computer for a teacher. The mayor has suggested, wait until next year. Well, that didn't work when teachers were promised multiple year raises. Why should they trust anyone who promises such today? They actually know the story of the student, of the little boy who cried wolf. We must ensure that our greatest influence, the teacher, is optimized to produce powerful and sensational positive effects with our students. So now it's up to us, nine members on this board, to find a way to cut less than 1% of our budget to find eight million for step raises for 2019, 2020. How do we do it? Well, one way is KA. If that's gonna produce, what did we say, 7.2 million? That's a start. Uh, we have, um, you know, possibly cutting things like Pencil Alignment Nashville, the funding for them, these organizations also raise their own money, cut more EDSSI, cut lead LTDSs, stop purchasing cars, and have our employees drive their own cars rather than continue to purchase cars. Um, bring each department head to the table and expect each one to find ways to cut the budget. Our number one goal is student achievement. We cannot do it if we don't have teachers in the classroom. So I move to send this budget back to administration to cut eight million to fund step raises for teachers and to generate uh, or to operate with a continuation budget until this is achieved. And I would appreciate a second. Yeah. 
second. Say something, Ms. Shepard. Did you say something, Ms. Shepard? Maybe not. I'm sorry. I'll second it. And then I've got comments. I'm good. Okay. Go ahead. So um, one of the areas that has been brought up to me are the literacy coaches, which are in every school. And of course, we want to be focused on literacy. I'm, but I, I've been told that we're spending $15 million on those literacy coaching positions. And if, first of all, would someone verify that? And second of all, if that is the case, is there a way to repurpose some of those coaches back into the classroom? I think some schools certainly need those coaches, but I have heard complaints from other schools that they, that's not really, if they had a choice in their student-based budgeting that in their, in their school budget, that they would choose probably not to fund those. So I'm wondering if there is a way to take out some of that money from the coaching positions. I'll start and, and I may have to ask Brian Hull to, to help me out, but as you indicated, uh, starting uh, this past year, uh, there was a requirement uh, from uh, Dr. Joseph for all schools to have uh, a literacy teacher development specialist in LTDS. That was a non-negotiable in the student-based budgeting. And uh, so every school uh, has been required to budget for that position. Uh, so I don't know, Brian, if you know what the total amount, dollar amount would be for all of the LTDS is in the schools, and you may not, I don't want to put you on the spot, but uh, I did want to go ahead and give that information uh, that, and this this is the second year that schools have been required to do that and when they've been putting their budgets together. For, and so um, those funds are in the school's budgets. They, they are district funds, but they are included in the student-based budgets for the schools. Um, Brian, anything to add? Uh, can, is it okay if Brian Hull addresses quickly? I know we're running out of time. Um, so each school does have uh, a literacy coach. Um, many of them were repurposed from math coaches or whatever previously. So uh, taking them out, um, if you did that at every single school, um, would lower the um, staffing and the support at those schools. Uh, most of the money that is paying for those positions is generated through the student-based budgeting. Um, so it would really kind of be um, tweaking the, the formula that we use. Um, there is a small amount, uh, several million dollars, but a small amount that is used to supplement those positions at our smallest schools. Um, so that could be something we looked at as far as not making it a non-negotiable. I don't think that the savings would be $15 million. And again, it would you know reduce uh, the supports available at a number of schools. Well, I'd love to see, I'm wondering if there, and I don't, maybe we have to have our final vote. Do we have to have our final vote tonight for, or can we? <clears throat> there is a provision to allow, and I'll look to Corey, but there is a provision to allow for school districts to operate on what's called the continuation budget, uh, which would be functioning at the same level, moving into the new fiscal year until a new budget was approved. I don't know that we've actually, in my 17 years, I don't think we've done that here. I think we've always tried to have a budget approved prior to uh, July 1. Yeah. But I think that is an option because I know other districts do it. Well, I'm just wondering if we could maybe survey the schools and figure out if there are schools that don't really want that position. Because, I mean, I don't, I don't know what savings it would. And then just see if there are ways that, because we need teachers in the classroom. I know that some, I, you know, I know two or three schools off the top of my head, and that's fairly meaningless, that are saying they don't really want those positions. So um, I wonder if we could find a way to survey schools and figure out what kind of savings we would come up with if we, um, if we repurpose those coaches into classrooms. And, and also, I mean, I'd be happy to hear from Dr. Battle and her staff about the, the direction for literacy, and we're hopefully going to have that discussion soon. But I mean, I don't want to take away from um, a plan that's in place, but it, it it seems to me that we are still working um, from a plan that was put in place a year or two ago, and I know we're in the midst of making changes. I'm wondering if that's an area where we could really tap some funds. Mr. Princeton. Mr. Princeton, remind, remind us, what's the percentage of the operating budget that is in people? Is it 70 percent? No, it's, uh, it's about 80 percent of the budget is salaries and benefits, which would be yeah, people and sure. positions. So that remaining 20% would be everything from all utilities to fuel to textbooks to anything that would be that would be non-personnel. Right. Okay. So 
I like Ms. Spearing's idea about just kind of ordering an across the board cut. I mean, typically in government, uh, what she's talking about, it, it's, it doesn't have a dollar figure attached to it, but it has a percentage attached to it that's designed to get to a dollar figure, so it gives the administration the flexibility to get there. And out of uh, an 800, what are we, an $885 million? 886 uh, million dollar operating budget currently if we cut you know one percent that throws off 8.8 uh, 8, almost 8.9 million uh, and if 80 percent of that's people uh, that's seven million in people you know that are um, cut as a result of that one percent across the board so I, I'm all in favor of it uh, well first of all I mean I, I think yeah I've said what I'm most in favor of which is curtailing uh, growth uh, in charter schools that we don't need as a way to get that $8 million if the only other option is to uh, administer a 1% across the board cut, which would result in 7 million cuts in people, then I guess we need to do there. But, but, but just bear in mind you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. I mean, some people are going to be put out of a job in order to give other people uh, pay raises, and that's going to be the net effect of, of all that. And, and again, I think it's mathematically understandable I'm not sure that it's that it's morally the right thing to do the other thing but I'm prepared to support the motion Ms. Spearing. the other thing I would point out is she um, went through a very um, intricate calendar over the better part of the last decade uh, that talks about how teachers have been and, and support employees have been deprived systematically of support uh, of step raises and other raises well that whole timeline uh, not coincidentally uh, aligns with the beginning of the explosion of charter schools in 2011 and 2012. So let's just be clear. And the one thing that's been so impressive to me about how teachers have used their voice in other states um, and support staff have used their voice in other states, they've drawn a direct line between growth in this at the expense of that. And I think we have yet to really have, you know, a functional conversation about about this. And it's, you know, the 11th hour of the budget debate. But but I'm I'm prepared to go along with a 1% um, across the board cut if um, if that's the will of the board. I do have a question. Uh, so you said that there, there have been continuation budgets or there have been provisions to allow for continuation budget. And I know I keep <coughs> hearing that the state is considering takeovers. How feasible is it that the state would come in and force their budget or would the city come in and enforce a budget if we can't come to an agreement? No, it wouldn't be that. It would be where <coughs> the board the school district would continue to operate at the same funding level as the previous fiscal year without adding anything new, just to continue operating until a new budget was approved. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, it, it happens uh, often, quite often, in some in other places. I'm assuming it's okay to do that here. I, again, I'm looking at Ms. Harkey, but I'm assuming that's an option here, um, where if the board were to not vote for a budget at the meeting tonight and were to vote. Uh, on a continuation budget, they could come back at a future date and pass the budget for the 2019-2020 fiscal year. Okay, so I just have a couple of things. I'm not, of course, as familiar with the literacy coaches. I do know there's one literacy uh, liter new literacy coach in my district who was a reading recovery teacher, um, was not exactly excited about going back to, the, back to the classroom, but will be a literacy coach this year. And I just know she has a, a, a lot of expertise to offer but if she may end up being at a school that chooses to keep the coach. And so I, I understand that you want to give uh, principals more autonomy if they believe that they shouldn't have, that they don't need this extra, extra position. Um, I, I would just be careful. I would, I would want us to be careful about some of those smaller schools who still could not afford to have a literacy coach. And because of our policy, we're giving extra, extra funding from the central office budget. So as long as those schools could still be supported, and I'm okay with, con with passing a continuation budget for now just to allow Dr. Battle and Ms. Shepard and Dr. Gentry to be here to weigh in also. I, I just think it's, we are kind of on shaky ground. We have not been really forcing the city to fund us the way we should have. That should have been our conversation this entire year, to be frank. But now we're at a point where we're just cutting, 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 and it, we had to make $15 million worth of cuts last year. And I remember that's how we ended up cutting positions from HR and cutting uh, a bunch of positions in communications and throughout central office because we were trying not to cut from schools. And I would just hate that we end up in a position where, yes, we end up uh, 
you know, cutting someone's position, making people lose their jobs to be able to afford others a raise. But I do still support the idea of, you know, trying to figure out how we can best fund our schools with the pennies that we're given. So, I'm again, I'm fine with the continuation budget, but I would just, I would caution us that we're starting to touch schools now, and that was one thing that we promised we wouldn't do, is touch the school level employees, and, and that might be a consideration here. The, the best case scenario in my mind is that Knowledge Academies, um, that we're able to prove that what we are trying to do is the most feasible, the most necessary for our students, we, and we recoup that 7.2 million. Um, yeah, anyone else? Yes, um, I, I didn't hear Ms. Uh, Frog say anything about cutting all of the literacy coaches. Um, you didn't say that. Um, I'm sorry? I said I don't think anyone said that. Yeah, well, I thought you were alluding to that, but it, nevertheless, uh, there's also a, uh, there, are, uh, there are also companies for energy conservation, uh, which without any additional money, we could save $20 million over five years. So uh, I, I, there's things that to consider, and I don't think that that is our job today. I think our job today is to send this budget back to, uh, to, to administration to let them think about uh, thinking out of the box and uh, energy con conservation, uh, you know, closing the uh, KA schools, if that is what the board chooses to do, that would be $7.2 million, we only need $8 million, um, and uh, I can think of several ways to get there, but it's not my decision. Um, so if there's not any more discussion, oh, Mr. Pinkston. Um, Mr. Ensign, remind me, didn't we enter into an ESCO contract recently? Yes, we did, okay. with Site Logic. Okay, so there, unpack that. There's already an energy savings initiative underway. Correct. You know, the right. board approved that back several months ago, a couple of months ago. And then on um, on the clawback for Knowledge Academies, should we close those three schools, 792 students actually at 10,400 per is 8.2 million. But what's the actual cost savings recovered from there? Mr. Ensign, do you know off the top of your head what, you know, is it is it 8.2 straight up or is it some percentage that's lower than that? Well, part, part of that answer, it depends upon where those students end up enrolling, uh, because I know in discussions with Mr. Queen, uh, a lot of the thinking is if a, if a family has already chosen a charter school, then they're likely to choose another charter school. So we don't know if they're going to if they're going to go to an MNPS run school or to another charter school. So that's part of the uh, the um, unknown about if that were to occur, what would the true savings be? It's a moving target, right? Uh, also, Mr. Henson, you said that we are doing some energy conservation. I asked this question a few weeks ago, and what I was told was it was very small. What I'm talking about is a large energy conservation, which you and I have talked about before. Is what you're doing now, is that going to save us $20 million over five years across the district? Or is it, what I understand is that it's implemented in only a few schools. No, it's uh, it's it's starting. It's uh, the board approved that contract back. Uh, I think it was sometime in April, and so it's just now getting started. I uh, don't have the exact number of what that would look like. I know there are a lot of companies out there who make a lot of promises on the front end as far as performance-based contracting, which we have run into issues at the state level through the comptroller's office with performance-based contracting. And so it's a, it's a complicated topic, but we're doing all we can as far as energy conservation goes, and that's why we, that's why we brought forth that contract back in April. Uh, I, I've talked to other school districts that are doing this, and they've been very happy. One of the boards in Indiana uh, just this week unanimously passed uh, the, this energy conservation plan that I'm thinking about. Um, so uh, there, there are ways to save money. There are ways to, to do this, and I don't know how much, I would like to know how much money you anticipate saving uh, per year with this company. So, um, yeah, Amy. Just want, I just want, since we're throwing out ideas, <laughs> and I, this is certainly not in our purview, but a couple other um, ideas have come up. One might be to look at our IT contracts um, with these large, I don't know how much we need for IT, but that might be an area to look at. Um, HR positions, um, we are about, we're, tonight we're approving a 
a change in our in our audit and and audit funding for HR. And I would be interested to know if there are ways that we can um, follow the recommendations of the audit and maybe find money from some of the positions. And I'm a little confused as to whether did we and we did not include the. We had, there was a request for, I think, three more positions in HR. It, that's not in this final. Correct. There is only the one position that's related to the R12 conversion, which is the position control, but the remaining positions are not included in, in Dr. Battle's recommendation. Okay. So, so IT, HR, and then I still would like just to see a number on um, – Top level salaries in the district, if they just for, forewent the 3% raise this year alone, and then we could revisit that next year. I know it's going to be a relatively small amount, but I feel like it's almost, you know, since once we did have some increases in pay a few years ago, I just think it's almost um, a symbolic act to, sh to tell our teachers and our um, support staff that you know we value you and we're willing to give up that three percent this year just to make sure you have what you need and so um, I would love to see um, if we were to choose not to give the three percent raise to those who work in central office um, I'm open how what that looks but maybe um, you know those who work in central office making over a hundred thousand dollars and but I know that's a sticky conversation we've had a couple times, but I've, I've just never seen a number on how much that would actually impact us. And uh, again, willing to hear from Dr. Battle and her staff on that. All right, so we'll, we have one more question, then we need to call for the question because this, we're past time for our meeting. Go right ahead. <clears throat> yeah, it's, I mean, it's not a question. It's a, it's a comment. If we vote on a continuation budget that freezes um, everything at current levels, that means that employees who were expecting a 3% COLA beginning as soon as six days from now, July 1st is the beginning of the fiscal year, are not going to get that. That means that we're not going to be able to give assurances uh, as the current draft budget does that we'll have those existing three, 25 and a half uh, pre-K program positions. It means that, uh, that planning uh, toward the beginning of the new school year for new textbooks and social emotional learning initiatives is going to be uh, stopped in the mud. So, I mean, if we're going to vote for a continuation budget, let's just realize what that means. You know, we're hitting the pause button on all new investments. And I'm more than happy to say, you know, tell the administration, go back and do an 1% across the board adjustment if the rest of the board is willing to, you know, just acknowledge publicly that that's going to mean cutting people in order to, to, to provide more funding to people, but just stopping everything is uh, is not uh, responsible governing, especially given that we're a little over a month out from the beginning of the school year. Can I repeat the, the uh, motion? Um, before I repeat the, mo the motion, I just want to say that uh, I think teachers would be happy if they had to wait a couple of weeks to get this 3% raise if they know that on top of that they're going to get a step raise. Um, my motion is I move to send this budget back to administration to cut $8 million to fund step raises for teachers and to operate with the continuation budget until step raises are included in the budget. Amy seconded okay. it already. Go right ahead. Oh, I, was gonna, I do have a clarifying question. Okay, I guess a clarifying question. Okay, so my clarifying question is, is that we would not vote, we would have this continuation budget until we have step, no matter what. But they would, in essence, have to find the 1%. Exactly. That's what we're saying. This would be a okay. telling administration, we want to see our teachers get a step raise. It's That's failed the, in several different areas. It is in our lap. What are we going to do? Even if it means... Even Getting if it leads to layoffs? It, it means uh, losing some positions, and uh, I think that uh, those people would certainly find jobs. We have so many openings, so I don't think anybody's going to be out of work. All right. All in favor, say aye. Or, I'm sorry, all in favor, raise your hand. All right, we have three. He had a biscuit. She has something to say. I want to say something. So this is this is why the motion was after. Yeah, vote. after yeah. the after we vote, then yes, you can. No, I want to do it before we vote. We've already started. Sorry. I understand. So, do we have any others? All in favor, raise your hand. You can call for another motion after can this. I... The, 
Okay, all opposed? All right. Either passes nor fails. Go right ahead and then at 515 we'll start the meeting. Okay, I'd like to make a motion. I would like to make a motion that we pass a continuation budget until our first July meeting when we will have a report from Dr. Battle about how we can come up with the $8 million that we need for step raises and then take a vote at that time so we can all move forward with the budget. Is there a second? Second. All right, all in favor, raise discussion. your hand. Discussion. Oh, shoot, I'm sorry. Oh, my God, a discussion. Yeah, I just want to reiterate, by passing a continuation budget tonight, we're putting a halt on preservation of pre-K seats We're putting uh, and teachers. Uh, we're putting a halt on acquisition of textbooks. We're putting a halt on deployment of social and emotional learning programs and investments. Um, and uh, I don't think that's a responsible thing to do uh, a little over a month out from the beginning of the school year. There are a lot of things that have to happen during the month of July, and our staff is already behind the eight ball trying to pull all that off, and I think this is unfair uh, to them. So that's for that reason, I'll, I'll vote no on a continuation budget. Other discussion? Yes. Um, so to do what Amy just did is what I was going to um, to bring up another motion, because I think that this is so important that we don't need to delay time, and we can always come back to the table in a couple of days or next week. We don't have to keep waiting. So this is urgency. This is what we do. That's what council does. They stay 12 o'clock and midnight, and they just get it done. We need to get it done. So it doesn't have to be that we have to wait until that time frame. This is urgent. So we can come up with any other time before that time if we want to. Right. So, I mean, we don't have to go on it. I'm sorry. No, no. Ms. Elrod. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to amend my motion. Oh, hold on one second. Ms. <laughs> okay. Elrod. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Pass. Let her amend. Go right ahead. I was just going to say, I would like to amend my motion to have a report by our first meeting in July or sooner, whichever comes first. That's reasonable. Is there a okay. second? What, what do you mean second. by report? I mean, a report from Dr. Battle. I would like to hear from Dr. Battle on ways that we might come up with this $8 million. And if, if the administration is able to, is ready to report back to the board before the first meeting in July, then we can call a special called meeting. All right, any further discussion? All right, all in favor, please sit, raise your hand. All right, all opposed? All right, thank you. Okay, if you would repeat your motion in the second and we'll vote. Uh, I move that we uh, pass a continuation budget until either the first meeting in July or until Dr. Battle is ready to present to the board ways that we may find the $8 million for step raises, uh, at which time we can call a special meeting if necessary. Second. I'm sorry, is there a second? Second. second. All right. I'll, no more discussion. All in. So, is does this also compel the district to find the eight percent, the eight million? Is it a? Are they compelled to do it no matter what with this motion? I am asking. I think this is looser. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I'm just asking for a report on ways that we can find the eight million dollars um, based on the discussion we had tonight and any other way they have in mind. Yeah. <clears throat> so I just have one other final comment. I mean, just after the events of the last week, I don't know why. You know, I'm even trying to do the administration any favors. So I recant, and I'm going to support this. Thank you. All right. Any other discussion? All right. All in favor, raise your hand. Oh, we finally have a unanimous vote. All right. And so ends the budget committee. We'll be looking to either have a report and a discussion at the July 1 meeting, I mean, the, the first July meeting, or um, at some point it is called before then. With that said, our meeting is now called to order 18 minutes late. Our apologies.